Joseph Tapanen, you know, went to go and hold Marshall King back just for a second, but enough that he couldn't get his full hand to the yeah. charge hand because he got, he got some hand on that. Great to see him back out on the field. He had some uh, distinguishable features <laughs> his haircut and the tape around the head, and he was a fan favourite. Itchy nuts. <laughs> <laughs> as, as said, boys, Please. thoughts on North Island versus South Island games? Welcome back to another episode, Ethram Dills. Willie, how's your weekend, lads? Yeah, good, very good. Nice family weekend this weekend. No footy uh, for the Fox Memorial, King's Birthday weekend, nice. so you had a nice break. Uh, you, how was your weekend? I'll tell you what. Uh, <laughs> I'll tell you what. <laughs> had another, another, as always, I always have a great weekend. Although you had your weekend off, Willie, without any rugby league, I was down in Aotearoa. Um, one of the Aotearoa Māori, New Zealand Māori rugby league tournaments down there, the 15s and 17s. So down in Aotearoa, uh, one of their many tournaments, great, uh, great tournament. Uh, people uh, happy, smiling, and it gives opportunities to our, our Māori kids. Um, 15s and 17s playing in a tournament, uh, Kotei Tanga, both in 15s and 17s took it out. So doing really well in those competitions. Um, that tournament comes around every year and they're normally one of the gun teams to keep an eye out. Obviously, I'm down there supporting the co-pop of Rugby League, but also working with the Māori Rugby League. But also uh, around there supporting the Hokianga uh, iwi as well, because that's where I'm from. So um, although they uh, didn't make it to the final, I thought they did a really did a really good job and proud and represented uh, really well. Some talent down there, Willie. How many, how many players do you reckon are down there playing? Oh... I think there, I think there was forty something teams between the between the the fifteens and the seventies. Wow. So uh, they get to play, I think, on the first day, depending on who's how many in your pool. You're either playing two or three games. You hit the Sunday on uh, yesterday was uh, quarter final, semi final, final, and you could imagine the size of these seventeen year olds these days. Right? Like I stood down there and I'm standing next to some of these guys, and I know we've mentioned a couple of um, Kiwi blokes on this show before. Um, Ben Takura and Xavier Willison. Some of those guys are pretty much looking like wow. them right now. And awesome. um, I think, you know, when I look when I look at talent, and I'm just watching the game because I love the game regularly, but I look at these guys and I feel like this is where the direction of the game's moving to. Some of these bigger bodies, uh, they can really carry their size, but also can move literally really well. Because we know and understand that the game is, is quick. And good on Māori Rugby League yep. for putting this on and allowing this platform and the exposure for these young fellas to this level of footy. Are there any other sports that do this in New I, Zealand? I don't think so. I think New Zealand Māori Rugby League have been doing it for a long time, uh, a really long time now. I, I was unfortunate I didn't get to play in any of these tournaments. I left at a young age and I would love to be able to do it. I'm fortunate now that I can have my sons here in New Zealand so I can get them to play and, and for Hokianga. Um, you know, to, to run, I think they do uh, 10s, 11s and 12s. They run uh, 13s and 14s. They run 15s, 17s. They they run our kōturos, our women's, and then and then they've got your older women and then your men. Uh, so there's about five or six tournaments that they run consistently every year. And I'll tell you what, in that uh, that 10s, 11s, and 12s, they hit nearly at 98 teams to close oh, to wow. close to even Jeez. 100 and. Uh, being Māori rugby league and what we do in Māori, you, you never turn down um, um, teams. Sometimes the task is too big, but they always seem to find a way to give all our uh, tamariki our opportunity to play on on there, which creates opportunities because, man, if, if, if you were down there, there's that many scouts from all over the NRL down there, and they're just IDing talent like crazy. So the good thing about what this creates, it creates opportunities, like I said, uh, but Māori rugby league uh, are passionate about what they do. Every single scout down there, man, and I'm thinking, holy, it's, it's great for our kids. But it also adds pressure. Uh, and I do feel sorry for a lot of our kids, even in the 13s and 14 space, because that's kind of the prime space to try and yeah. get them over the line when they hit 15. Agents are coming in at 15. You can only be signed at 15. So um, these most of these 15s and 17s now that are playing are either connected to an agent or have a contract to a club. So... Um, you can imagine the quality that's coming over. There is a couple of Australian teams that come over and play in the competition that lifts the standard right up. But the game is growing so much uh, in, in rugby league over here in New Zealand. And the Māori, Aotearoa Māori New Zealand Māori Rugby League do a really good job at it, man. And you know, pump for them, pump for the kids because, you know, I'm a proud Māori. 
a, a person and to see our Māori kids running around and enjoying themselves and, and smiling and their parents and their whānau, all their support them, outstanding. So, yeah, big ups to, to Māori Rugby League and what they're doing in the game. Keep doing your thing and uh, keep representing. <laughs> Chew. Um, I've got a question for you. Like, players, any NRL players that currently that have come through that tournament that you know of? Oh, we were a bit spoiled yesterday. Uh, Jazz Tavanga come down. Uh, so oh, yeah. he was he was up in uh, Rotorua, oh, down in Rotorua, sorry, um, and he came down in support. I think he had a nephew or cousin in, in one of the teams. So it's great to see some so those guys. I know Chance, Chance played in it. I know Jackie Laban's played in it. Obviously, yeah. Kotei Tanga. Um, they normally um, poach the best players, uh, the best of the best. So, <laughs> as a, if you're watching this, bro, yeah, you're doing a good job, brother. Keep poaching all those players and keep stacking your team, man. How good. Uh, so, yeah, there's, there's just three I just noted, I uh, named off really quickly, but there's, there's so much more. Um, it is a pathway for a lot of our Māori players, our young Māori players as well, and that kind of gets them the stepping stone to being recognised. But, but then, again, on the back of that, um, opportunities come, which is obviously pathways into to the Warriors, obviously agents, clubs are watching from the NRL. So it's a great, it's a great tournament, and I love being down there and supporting it. So, um, yeah, some, some great talent. Excited. Yeah. Were you getting in any airs of parents or...? No, 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 I, no, not not for me. Um, <laughs> I, I'm down there just watching and, and much more shaking hands and taking photos and smiling and uh, meeting people. <laughs> um, but it's always nice to see active players, you know, in the game down there because especially guys that have played in there, which is great because uh, there's not too many opportunities that you get guys that have played in those tournaments to be able to take time off in their schedules to be down in Rotorua to give a little yeah. bit of their time back to the game that has created opportunities for them. You're talking about some of these young kids already aligning with agents and watching might not be scouting or doing anything. Anybody ask you questions about the business side of it and get some advice from yourself? Yeah, well, no, not really, Willie. Uh, and this is mostly one thing that I, um, I'm always open for mm. because, you know, I know the pressures of what happens when it comes to agents. I know the pressures of, you know, want to, and I guess what agents can sell you. Um, I also understand that there's obviously football managers down there that they can sell you those dreams. So I'm always open for families and parents and kids to ask questions. Hence why most of I'm in and around all that stuff, yeah. even around the community too, because I want them to feel comfortable in what they make, but I also want them to feel like, hey, if they can talk to someone that's walked those same footsteps as, as a lot of those kids, um, so if there's parents out there that obviously need some support or want to ask questions, I'm always there for it. And that's must be another thing why I'm down there as well is to, to be that voice for, for our Māori players, but to also be the voice for our parents if they need some to ask questions around the pressures of what it takes for the next step from these tournaments and where they have to go. I mean, that's awesome. So we'll move on to some news for the week and I'll pass this straight to you, Willie. There's some sad news about um, Super League legend Rob Burrow. So if you just want to tell us. Yeah, about tough that. tough this morning to wake up um, to the news that my old teammate uh, Robbie Burrow passed away. Um, has lost his fight to uh, M&D this morning. Um, a fight that he's uh, been having since December 2019. Um, so honoured to have been able to share a dressing room and a field with uh, a legend um, that is Rob Burrow, um, a winner of eight grand finals, played for England. Um, he only stood five foot five, but he was a man mountain to us and a champion of a fella, a champion of a, of a dad and husband. Um, yeah. Our thoughts go out to Lindsay and Jackson, Meyer and Macy, his kids. Um, and some of the stuff that he and our captain at Leeds, Kevin Simfield, what they've been able to do with their fundraising, Kev's been able to run ultra marathons and been doing some long distance marathons. Uh, just before I left, he ran 100 miles in 24 hours. Whoa. Um, <laughs> Crazy. For... For um for Rob and to raise funds, they've raised over twenty million pound um, for the research in M and D, um, and the awareness that they've created with it throughout Britain and throughout uh, the UK about M and D, um, they've reached a lot of um, families and a lot of people with their work that they've done, but they've also given a lot of support to a lot of people. 
and heard somebody read something this morning. Um, one of the players that used to play for Leeds, his mum unfortunately has just been diagnosed with it, but she found a lot of support through what Rob did with his fight and he fought right to the very end and it was, um, yeah, tough to wake up to that. We've lost a, a great servant, a great player and 41 is just too young, but too young. Um, God rest him and... And mm. he goes in peace. He rests now. He's uh, at ease. But uh, he'll always be uh, one of uh, my favourite teammates. Did you ever play against him yourself, Adam? Yeah, I was I was young in my career. Um, you know, when I when I went over to Australia and played in the World Club Challenges for, for Melbourne my first year, 2006. And, you know, you saw this little fellow on the field and you thought, yeah, there's a spot, you know what I mean? You're going to run at the smallest guy on the field. But like Willie said, tough. Um, hard to handle, quick to, um, tenacious for a little fellow. Went out there and went after everything he did. So, um, yeah, and then obviously in international stuff too, playing for for New Zealand against him for, and when he's playing for England. Um, yeah, and again, it's, it's sad news for rugby league. I think um, for whatever, well, for everything that he's done in the game over in the UK, obviously for England and international stuff, and then for his teammates. Obviously, Willie's spoken about that as well. I mean, um, what a what a proud dude he was all the way to the end. Um, and a strong family. Uh, his wife obviously done us so much for him, but everyone around him, Kevin, you know, watched all those stuff with his marathon stuff. And, you know, he's carried him over the line a few times. I'm just like, man, what a dude. Like, one of his best mates and carrying him over the line and doing everything he can possible to, I guess, raise awareness, but keep him going. Um, keep giving him hope. Um, keep trying to give him some more days, uh, give him a few more years. And, you know, he got to spend, you know, his partner and his, his wife and his kids got to spend as much as they could with him. But now he's at ease. So, um, you know, rest in peace, brother. I hope, you know, your family as well and everyone's looking after them as well. Yeah, rest in peace, Rob Burrow. Um, so moving on, on to some NRL news. This is an, a story of some overcoming of adversity. Cody Ramsey, Dragons player no. uh, he's been off the field for 18 months he's finally back in training he's been suffering with um ulcerative colitis and he's finally just had uh last week his first running session again with the team i mean man that must be tough you're you're basically he was in hospital for this for yep. weeks and then ha basically told he has to retire and are now 18 months gone he's able to be back man it must feel good for him yeah, it'd be outstanding, I guess, you know, after 18 months on the sidelines and fighting, obviously, this this issue, being in hospital, you know, when you talk about adversity, we all go through some at some stage, not only in our football careers, but in life, and this is mostly the biggest hurdle that he's had to overcome, and when you hear the news about saying that, you know, you're not going to be able to, or you're going to have to retire, I guess that, that athlete in you and that competitiveness in you says, hold on a minute, I'm going to give this everything I can to get back out on the field. And a credit to his, I guess, his mental toughness as well. I know he, he would have struggled through some times there, some dark times. He's obviously got some great support around him, and it's great to see that, a, you know, only young too, only young in his career when he come on the scenes and done some good things at, at Dragons early. Um, but, you know, he's he's come he's overcome this obstacle and this hurdle and he's back on the field. And, gee, that would have been a nice day to put on his boots again or even his running shoes and step on the grass and, and go and run around with your teammates. And I know I get, I'm assuming that all the, the Dragons players would have been cheering him on that day because uh, to go through those tough times, you've had to have some strong support around him. I'm not going to say that I know too much about ulcerative colitis, but I do know some people that have been diagnosed with it. Um, and from what I've seen them go through, the, the early days are the tough bits. You know, as he as he was in hospital for quite an extended time there to begin with, and it's taken him 18 months to come out the other side. Um, but it is manageable, from what I understand. You got to change your diet and your eating habits. And I'm sure if he can do that, he'll be back playing in no time. It's great to see him back out on the field. Uh, he was one of those. He had some uh, distinguishable features, <laughs> his haircut and the tape around the head. And, uh, he was a fan favourite mm. in the few games that he played. So I know the fans will be really excited to see him back. And hopefully uh, before the season's out, he may even get himself a game. But just to see him back healthy and happy, back being able to get fit again physically, for the game is is the first step and just take it day by day and you know, I've already seen today just be grateful that he's able to be mm. out be out there mm. again 
and enjoy what he does best. Certainly. So it'll be a long road. Obviously, we don't know the exact time frame of when he'll actually come back to the field, but the first step is always the most important one. I just want to say a, a props to the Dragons Club because they actually, he's been out for two years almost, not playing for them. They've been paying him his contract money and they actually offered him a deal to split the last year of his contract, which was this season, into half and he could do the sec- be paid the second half of the contract next year so he still has his job next year mm. at which point he might he might be back by next season so i just think it's a good on them mm. for you know sticking by his side in a time when there's been some tensions between players and clubs so good on the dragons i guess nice um moving on to some our first little taste of origin stuff for this <laughs> episode uh which is the women's origin 2 preview uh, game two is on this Thursday, 6 June, 9.45 New Zealand time, 7.45 Australian time at McDonald Jones Stadium, which is a big uh, bonus for New South Wales. they got heaps of nights in there. <laughs> uh, the only changes that I'll just bring up is um, Queensland only. New South Wales, same team. Queensland have Emily Bass has injured her shoulder, so she's out. And Zahara Tamara has been dropped to the reserves. What are your guys' takes on uh, the second game of Origin for the women? Oh, it's a it's definitely a must win for Queensland, and normally the team that loses, uh, they they normally comes changes, and that's what Queensland have done. They've changed around Ali Brigginshaw, who is a as a gun seven, uh, is a key to what Queensland have done in the past. Also been a key for the Broncos. It's a sold out game in, at, at Newcastle, which is great that everyone's supporting the women's game, the women's space. It is an Origin, um, but they'll be up against it. Uh, you'd be liking this if from New South Wales yeah, you know right. they've got a quality sign yeah, if, right. if anyone watched their game they're a, they're a strong competitive bunch of women um, they'll have their hands full here Queensland they have to go up to um, go up to McDonald's Orange Stadium and try and get a job done but if there's someone that can do it on their home stadium it's who? To make it up then she's going to be she's going to be gun up there she's going to need it they're going to need all the help they can Queensland but looking forward to to what is a start of you know the origin period for both men and women yes they've already had one game but this is an exciting time yeah unfortunately for Queensland they lost their home advantage or to, the opportunity to win and take the home advantage uh, by losing that first game up at Suncorp they've got to go do it now in the, the opposition's territory and do a job against New South Wales in front of a packed out crowd, it's going to be sold out at McDonald's Jones Stadium. So, uh, no sweeter place than to do it in front of a, a packed out house and try and quiet and all the Blues fans and keep all those blue jerseys nice and quiet. <laughs> but yeah, to Mika Upton, there were some question marks. And I'd, I thought in the first game, Queensland were all off the pace. Mm. They were all off. New South Wales, hands down, were a lot better, especially the first half. They, they ran all over them. And. Ellie Brigginshaw came in for some stick and, you know, she's the captain. She was one of the big-name players in the, in the game and she, questions about whether she's passed it now, whether she's coming around the back end of her career and the game was too fast for her. I think moving into the halves will be a good mm. ploy for Queensland, moving her closer to the ball. She can control proceedings. She's uh, been a superstar in that position and I think she gets to link up with Tamika Upton a bit more and I think that'll make uh, Queensland a bit more dangerous in game two. I'm definitely excited to see uh, Jamie Chapman score a hat trick, which she's just <laughs> definitely going to do because New South Wales are too good for Queensland uh, in both teams, but especially in the women after game one. Oh, we'll see. <laughs> um, so we didn't have much news today, so I decided we'll chuck in some YouTube comments from our last episode. So I'll read a couple of these for you guys and you can give your takes. So first up we have ETH. Uh, has said, honestly surprised Barnett isn't a bench player, to be honest. Barnett has been outstanding where the likes of Lin Yu has played only four to five games and gets an origin bench spot. I honestly hope he takes Hudson Young's spot. So that was obviously in reference to Mitch yeah. Barnett being 20th man of origin. He didn't end up doing that. What, what do you guys take on that? Yeah, I, I, I was quite surprised. I thought Mitch Barnett had done a good enough job to earn him a position on the bench, and I think we both thought that anyway when we selected our teams for New South Wales. Um, he's been Mr. Consistent, I think, over the last 
year and a bit for for the Warriors. Uh, even this year, with all the amount of injuries that have been through the Warriors team, he's been the one that's most really stood up the most for me, and obviously, hence why his performance has got him. Uh, you know, selected in the New South Wales team, and when you talk about Spencer, he's a different type of player when it comes to, to what he what he can bring off the bench. Um, you know, he's an impact player. I don't think there's too many other guys in the competition that, that do or does what Spencer can do when he comes on. He can change the momentum of the game with his carries. Um, he finds his front and can build all those things on the back for the for the New South Wales team. But I definitely think that you know thought that. Uh, Mitch Barnett deserved a spot over. Oh, like it's hard. I, I think you know all, all three guys deserve to be in that position. I, I definitely think that Hudson Young's done a good enough job, and he's an origin player. You know, Spencer's strong. He, he brings a different impact. But Mitch Barnett, the same thing. They've all got something to offer to the team. So, you know, it, it's unlucky, but someone has to miss out, and it, it's Mitch Barnett. So, yeah, disappointed for him, but. You know, it's it's a three three game series. Like there could be an injury that comes up, which normally has happened, and he could find himself on the, the Origin side. Yeah. yeah, he's been great all year. He's been one of the few Warriors that has shown some consistency from start to finish. And I really like the fact that since he's been given the captaincy, mm. in the absence of some other senior players, he's stood up even more for the young fellas at the Warriors and. Yeah, I'm a bit surprised that he hasn't been able to get a, a berth on the bench, but uh, I think Spencer Lanier's a firebrand, and we've been saying mm -hmm. for weeks that uh, Michael Maguire was going to go for a team that was one in form and one that had some sting and some, you know, some grunts about it, and that's what Spencer brings off the bench, whether that's for 10, 20 minutes or whatever, he's going to just throw himself into his work, and that's what Michael Maguire wants. And I think New South Wales and haven't had too many of those in the last couple of seasons, so... I think he'll he'll definitely take one of those spots, and if it was to be one for Mitch Barnett, it was going to be Hudson Young. Mm. Um, the argument could be that he's played predominantly back row and he can cover that. Well, Barnett's been a back rower too. That's my argument against it. So both been on form. Both uh, Hudson Young was there last year, showed that he can handle the arena. Um, if Mitch Barnett can just bide his time yeah. to his first camp, just hopefully soaked it all up this week, come back to the Warriors against the Cowboys lead again from the front give yourself an opportunity if it doesn't come on Wednesday night for sure um, so <coughs> next comment was in reference to we talked about bringing Oris <laughs> sorry bro that was a sneeze <laughs> <laughs> sorry fire get it all out get it all out <laughs> um, we talked about bringing State of Origin Willie it was your point to to New Zealand bringing it here uh <laughs> Itchy Nuts <laughs> has, has said, boys, Please. thoughts on North Island versus South Island game. So obviously North Island, South Island of New Zealand, our own version of Origin. What do you, Has that been a thing before? Surely someone would have suggested that before. I don't think you can replicate it. You can't try and copy Origin. It's too too big a machine. You know, it's, it's too big an operation now to where it is and if you try and copy it or try and do something similar, you've got to be respectful enough to understand that I've, you've got to start right at the beginning and start with one game again. Just like the NRLW did, start with two games. Start with one, two, three, build it up. You can't expect North and South or whatever game we try and do here to be exactly the same. There's some difficulty with, difficulties with it, especially with the clubs and the game itself wanting to release players. At this moment in time, we're looking at how many players are missing out on Origin through injury, um, and I don't think the clubs will be up for another game. Um, it's hard enough to get internationals up and going, and this has been spoken about for a long time, about North and South, and I remember the early whispers about it, and the early rumblings were that Wellington may be part of the South Island in order to give South Island some numbers, and north of Wellington there was enough players in Taranaki, through the East Coast, Auckland and Whangarei to fill a North Island team so Wellington could go to the South. But again, that, I don't know if the Wellingtonians would want to play for the South Island. So that doesn't work on that front. Um, so I, I just think it's very, very difficult now logistically and then to try and fit it into a tight window of, you know, the, the calendar's already full for the NRL and clubs and coaches wouldn't be best pleased to have to release the players again for another one game. So I, I I think it's very, very tough to do and to do right even more so. I just don't see how 
we in the north can hate the south as much as what origins like you know trying to yeah. like you said replicate what the origin it's it's something different yeah it is something different and i guess you you wouldn't know unless you played the game and you felt the feeling that these queensland guys have for the new south wales and vice versa you know what i mean and i just don't think us here in new zealand are, are, are like that when it comes yeah. to you know North versus South, yeah. uh, but again, when you talk about the season, it's it's too long. And like you said, we're always fighting for more international games, and we can barely get that many games yeah. on the calendar because the season's now dragged out even longer. Uh, and then they're talking about having breaks between, you know, the Origin and having some periods there. So, and th this this thought's been here for a long time of North versus South, and you know, people toss up their teams and stuff like. That. And if you look at both teams, some quality players all through it. But I just don't feel that we have the same. I guess hatred for yeah. the state or for the island than that the yeah. Australian boys do when it comes to Queensland because you you you're born into that you're born into the the Queensland origin from you know from the moment you start walking and you start can read yep. and you can you can watch games like schools over there on Wednesday everyone in Queensland will wear their Queensland gears on on Wednesdays so they 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 they're in it from yep. prep from prep. So four-year-olds are wearing Queensland gears. It'll be the same in, in, in New South Wales. So I just don't think we have that same feeling no. as what they do over in, and how they want to represent the game. Because it, it's like when I was living in Brisbane, it was the same. Like I was chucking Queensland gears on my boys when they're going to school. You know what I mean? Because man, that, that's what it's about. If yeah. you didn't have one on, you'd the odd one out. So you didn't want to be the odd one out. But they love Queensland. Obviously, New South Wales love New South Wales. And... I don't know how we can replicate the same thing, mm. and yet the season's too long. I don't feel like we can put that in there. And yeah, like you said, we have to start from the, the start, but I think it's too far gone. And I know you hate when I talk about rugby, but Rugby Union did something like this a couple of years ago. They had a North versus South game, and I think it's just completely finished up because the passion obviously yeah. wasn't enough whatever and that's even with a sport that has more of a professional presence it would have been easier to convince the clubs to release players if it was during the season well, you know one where there might be a little bit of passion league versus rugby oh, <laughs> you know what i mean like you're talking about me saying i don't like much rugby but hey you chuck some league Hold players that. versus some rugby <laughs> players then we may have a bit of a conversation there when we talk about maybe hate i don't know if they hate them but hey you might get a little bit more from yeah, that. That's you know, for sure. Yeah, that, not not yeah. the North versus South rugby, but well, a bit like the All Blacks used to. Um, the Kiwis used to have a Kiwi trial, possibles versus probables. Yes, where the mm. where the blokes from England had to come back and the guys playing in Australia had to come over. You had to trial to make the Kiwis, mm. and that trial was always at Carwell Park. And uh, you know, even that was just a trial game. It, it lacked the punch or the fire that two teams really hated each other. They were, they were playing for spots on the Kiwis, but some most of those guys that were in the game knew whether they were on the team or not. So, yeah, it's, it's difficult without... Because that's what Origin's built on, passion. Mm. It's built on that passion, state versus state, mate versus mate. You go out and you leave, whether it's your teammate, somebody else, and you just go for it. Yeah, so maybe not itchy nuts. Uh, <laughs> maybe not. Uh, and I got one more comment here, which is is just a it's just a quick answer, I think. David Witchman says, "Love the content, Matua Blair and Willie, but I've waited almost two hours <laughs> for you to speak anything decent in rugby league this week. <laughs> State of origin." <laughs> Oh, if state of origin, Kiwis aren't allowed to play the rest of the games. So who cares? Up the mighty frickin' wa. <laughs> Except he didn't, he didn't censor himself. And I think there's a pretty simple answer to that, man. Uh, you can actually skip forward in the video <laughs> so you didn't don't, have to watch the whole thing. Don't be giving away all our secrets, well, man. Well, I mean, if yeah. he really hates hey, the look. Australians that much, he doesn't have to, like, listen to it. But um, we appreciate it. Yeah, yeah, I appreciate the bro, David, appreciate for um, giving us your feedback too, brother. But, yeah. The show covers off a lot of things, and yes, always the Warriors are going to be in there, so um, keep hanging around. Yo. Yeah, for sure. Uh, and with that said, let's hop into the games about all these mean Australian teams. <laughs> 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 um, uh, and all the games this week were an upset on the ladder, which I think is pretty interesting. So it was a lot of you know, tight games in this uh, a lot of cheering fans lower down the table. And the first of those was the Eels versus the Sharks. 
at Combank Stadium, 34 to 22 to the Eels. They finally broke their slump thanks to Mitch Moses and Clint yeah. Gutherson's return. How was that game, eh? Yeah, well, I think um, if you're a massive Warriors fan and watching these teams at the top lose and watching the Warriors just creep closer to the eight, which is what everyone's thinking, um, you know, you would enjoy you would enjoy this game. Um, all those Eels fans. I don't actually know too many Eels fans here in New Zealand. I know a couple of guys um, who are passionate Eels fans and hate or seeing them lose and been hard to watch. And we've spoken about you know hard to watch them here on this show as well. And I guess our big t- our big our, always our big conversation or our talking point was always around Dylan Brown, and he has been the centre of attention because of his experience and his, obviously the quality of footballer that he is and an international player that. It is. So when when we watched the the uh, the, the eels play the sharks, uh, you know, I, I knew there was going to be a change in how they they were going to play or a change in attitude, a change in energy because they had, like you said, Clint Gutherson, Mitch Moses, who's been sitting on the sideline, but also knowing that you know Origins there and anything can happen in that time. But what he done for the team and also for Dylan Brown, Dylan Brown's best game by far. Since being able, like, since not having Mitch Moses there, the amount of um, space that he allowed Dylan Brown to have, and the way that he attacked, attacked the ball and attacked the opposition with his attack, mate, he was hard to stop. And I thought, you know, credit to, I guess, the, the Eels were just hanging tough um, and being able to get this one up against a, a Sharks team who is at the top of the table, like around one and two at the top of the table, and have been consistent with their performance, not of, of late. But a tough team to beat. Um, so, you know, Eels fans will be stoked. They would have been happy with this win. And, you know, Mitch Moses is back on the field. And, you know, I'm sure they were thinking SOS into um, New South Wales. What do you reckon? Oh, man, I mean, maybe. <laughs> with that injury to Hines is persisting. He could make it in the next few games. Yeah. I underestimated the impact that those two were going to have mm. on the Eels. I'd, I'd, I'll be honest there. I'd, I've had a shocker of a weekend as far as my picks with all the favourites and the, the ones that higher on the ladder, <laughs> falling over and started on Thursday night with this one. Um, he was outstanding, Mitchell Moses. His running game, his kicking game, mm. you know, just brought them back to the fore, as did uh, Clint Gutherson. You know, I'd, he, I just thought they lifted everybody else, and that was their biggest impact. We saw everybody across, we've already spoken about Dylan Brown, but I thought the front row is Junior Polo mm. and Regan Campbell-Gillard. Widemu Gregg, from the start, his impact to carry the ball into the line, I thought that was an indication that Parra were on for the evening. They were going to be ready to roll their sleeves up and go to work for the first time in a little while. The Sharks were disappointing whilst missing a couple of players. They still had quality out there. They still had some quality. That try that... Mulatalo scored um, that he set up Will Kennedy outstanding you know that length of the field Will Kennedy passes Mulatalo 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 turns people inside out and then back inside yeah. just before half time that was an outstanding piece of, because just before that Mulatalo he was hanging he was tired yeah. but he just found enough energy to get in position get the ball and go 80 metres so they gave themselves chances they had, they had enough quality out there the Sharks and Craig, Craig Fitzgibbon will be disappointed with their evening's work, but yeah, welcome back, Gutherson and, and Mitchell Moses. I think the one thing that I noticed was um, the offloads that the Eels were ripping out, which mm. is like their signature thing yep. of like last year, a couple of years. Um, they had 19 to 7 against the like the Sharks at yep. 7, and guys like Cartwright, Tuilangi, Polo as well, all getting heaps of offloads for themselves, which just came, I think, from that confidence that he, that Moses brought, which I I found pretty interesting. Well, they're, they're a big offloading team. Uh, and when things are going well off the back of their hard, direct running, that's what they create. So previously they're trying to create that without having yeah. that momentum and they've gone to try and create things without hitting and going hard first and winning the, the collision, winning the battle. Um, and then you see them on the other night when they played there's a night they just went after it poked their nose through when you guys got like guys like Mitch Moses around the ball and then Cartwright and the things that they can do all it is is a quick offload they zing it right to Dylan Brown out wide or Cartwright and they just spread the ball from side to side that's Parramatta when they're playing their yeah. best footy that's what they do for sure 
You chase if you go into a game thinking I'm going to manufacture some offloads, and very rarely does it work. Very rarely does it come off because you you're almost playing passively. But when you've got the mindset, I'm just going to run today, and if my if I get my arms through, you push with me. More often than not, it comes off. Yeah. So they had the right mindset and approach to the game. Mm. I mean, as for the Sharks, in recent weeks, as you said, uh, their their defense has been kind of shocking. They've conceded 30 points at least in their last three games, 30 to the Roosters, 42 to the Panthers, of course, and 34 to the Eels. What's gone wrong with their defense? Because they were, I think they were top defense in mm. the comp for a while, and now it's just sort of chilling out at the moment. Yeah, yeah I think they, they they build their side around us obviously being tough defensively, but then also can score tries because their back five are strong and they carry the ball back, get them into some good positions, and then Nick, Nick Hines get them into a position where they can score points. So, I think for them, it's I guess it's stripping it right back and just double downing on their standards. They know what that looks like because they've, they've they've proven it at the start of the season. Um, it's just going back to the basic fundamentals of of defence and, and working together, staying connected. Again, a lot of these teams that are get, go under a bit of pressure, it's just looking within uh, and finding the things that you need to be better at consistently. Um, you kind of skim over some of those things, those those good habits sometimes when you're winning. When you start losing, then you've got to kind of dial it back and have a look at what are the, the details or what do we stand for defensively and, and, and double down on those standards. So I think they'll just strip it right back uh, and, and focus on you know what works for them and, how that, and what that looks like at trainings. Yeah, they've got to be honest in those conversations too that they have. Because I, I said last week, after that capitulation against Penrith, losing 42-0 and flying high at the top of the ladder, mm-hmm and falling over at that really tough question, coming up against a team that you'd expect to be there or thereabouts and being a bit of a yardstick for them to lose 42-0. They needed to come out, and I said this last week, they needed to come out and not just get a big win, but win and perform well. And they didn't do that. They didn't do that at all. So they have, there's still some questions to be answered whether mm. they are genuine contenders for me. They were my team at one point as the team of the moment. Mm. And they've gone the other way a little bit and they've regressed in the last two weeks. I think a similar thing sort of happened last season for them as well. They were mean as for a long time, but then towards the end of the season it uh, sort of fell apart. Um, one more thing, uh, Blaze Talangi was obviously on yeah. the bench, Full unused yeah. <coughs> substitution. He probably was going to come on for one of the injured boys in case they needed it because mm. Moses was out for like two months. So, But ended up not needing him. Uh, Trent Barrett liked what he saw. However, um, it came out after the game yeah. that Bailey Simonson uh, might have an ACL injury. It could be his season done. So there might still be a chance for Blaze Talangi in this team, even with Gutherson and and Moses back, which is exciting for me because I like watching Blaze. Yeah, I Blaise. think yeah, I think Blaze. It was a weird one for me, but yeah, again, it's if you're going to carry him, you're going to have to find somewhere to play him because he can do th- some special things on the field. So he might as well have not taken him on the field because I know what this causes. It causes a bit of a media problem now because there's already already been conversation around whether he's going to be staying or going. You sit someone on the be- on the bench and not playing at all, and now it becomes a bit of a an, a media issue where they start they start trying to write stories around. You know, he's not wanted at the club. Someone else wants him. So then now the pressure gets put back on Parramatta Eels because they were already under some pressure with their performances. Now they're going to be in some more outside noise around players wanting to move or players not wanting to be there. Coach doesn't want me. Who's the coach coming in? So this is what that causes. Again, like I said, if you're not going to use him for anything, you might as well have not played him. Uh, again, they're still going to cause problems anyway from the outside yeah. noise, but a quality player, um, surprised that he didn't get used. And yes, uh, hopefully Bailey doesn't have an um, ACL because that'll be disappointing. I thought I think he's been he's carried himself well in the in, in the tough times that Parramatta have, haven't had those boys there and done a really good job in this position. So fingers crossed he doesn't have a, an ACL. He's been good since he went from Canberra. Bailey Simonson, you know, mostly a winger there, but becoming a pretty accomplished accomplished centre playing at Para. But, yeah, there's going to be a big media beat-up about Blaise Talangi and not playing. And the big one rubbing his hands together is the agent. He's got a good argument together now to try and go get him mm. the best contract. Because, as we said before, yeah, you know, who's the coach? Is he going to play me? If it's Trent Barrett, does he like me? Does he, is mm. he going to play me? 
I need to go somewhere where I'm going to play. It could be a little bit of a Zach Lomax affair. Yeah, for sure. Um, moving on to second game, uh, the one on Friday. Possibly the <laughs> least entertaining for a casual <laughs> of all the games. No offence to the teams involved, but just the scoreline. Knights versus Bulldogs at McDonald Jones. 32-2 to two to the Bulldogs. And the Knights... We're on a big win streak mm. ever since Caleb Pongo was out. They didn't lose until today or on Friday to the hands of the at the hands of the Bulldogs. Sorry, and yeah, it was just a bit of a domination from them. Yeah, I I, I don't tip much, but I would I I my thinking for that game was Knights to beat the Dogs, um, but it was poor. They you mm. know two points. I, I they just didn't look like they had anything in their attack. Um, They're trying to f- look great things but didn't happen and trying to find opportunities but the Bulldogs keep building they keep um, being consistent defensively is what's pleasing me and I think you know 18 months in the job Serrato's finding about what kind of team he has and and when you when you when you when you have a team, you want teams that turn up for each other. There was opportunities all through that game where you just seen them working hard for each other. Um, you know, some great try score from 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 the Bulldogs boys. Uh, they they were they were strong throughout that game. Ran some good lines, but they turned up. And I think when you when you have a strong team that turns up for each other, that works hard, um, that f- never gives up when there's moments of like chasing someone back. I think we saw a, a good chase back there from the back rower. Yep. He he did a great run there, got in the way, got a ball back. So like those are moments that when coaches sit back and watch the video, or even in the game and in, in the stands and go, that's the turning point. And yep. there was plenty of turning points that night for the Bulldogs, and they just took all everything away from the Knights. I thought, you know, when you look at the Knights, you come off a bye consistency with some of the the results. Maybe they were looking too much into the head headlines and, and patting themselves on the back, getting a little bit complacent. I heard Coach Adam O'Brien talking about maybe we need to just stop social media for a bit. Um, you know, finding, I may be looking for an excuse that they just didn't turn up really prepared to go after a tough game. And again, like they're going to always say, you know, we, we saw there was intense in what they did. We didn't see this during the week. They trained well, all these things. But this is what you have to, in the NRL, you have to turn up week in, week out to be the best because it doesn't matter who you play on your day. And as we've seen over the weekend, you can be at the top of the table and still lose to some of these teams that are fighting down the bottom because these teams down the bottom are are building. Bulldogs are finding themselves in in a nice spot at the moment where they're becoming a tough team to uh, to beat. So Knights struggle, Bulldogs, great win. Yeah, I think complacency was an issue for them. Looking at the team sheet when it came out, no Crichton, no Kikau, Mm. no Burton. Knights are probably thinking, all right, we've got this one in the bag. But when they went 2-0 up and took the penalty early, I was confused. You know, you put them to the sword and try and test them out early doors and take the tap in front of the sticks and try and go again. But, yeah, they took 2-0 and um, to their detriment, they didn't score again. The dogs were outstanding. I uh, thought Ado Carr, um, in his response to not being picked in origin, Scored two outstanding tries. Unfortunately for him, he's hurt his hamstring and hopefully it's not too bad for him um, because he's been very, very good this year. But across the park, they're great. One I like for the dogs is young Preston, the back rower. Mm -hmm. I think is a real gun for the future. I think he got their their best player last year in the club. Like, he's only young on the scene. I'm not surprised, yeah. And that was was the one they did the chase back and everything. Like, he's been solid for them, man. So good. Really solid. solid. I, I can see that him playing on the same edge as Crichton and working with him, some of what Crichton has professionally is rubbing off on him because his work ethic is non-stop. You know, he's a, becoming a bit like a Liam Martin. He does a lot of stuff off the ball, talking about going and collecting the kick and you know escorting back when a lot of people don't. You're working harder off the ball than your opposition and get rewards. And he's, he's scoring some too. He's... A very, very good player for them. And uh, what Cameron Serrata has been working hard at for the last 18 months is finally coming through for them. I, I think they're going to make the playoffs. I picked them to make the playoffs where they are now. They're going to be dangerous if they do. It was that, it was that, tackle, it was that tackle on Greg Marge in the corner. That's what the tackle was. That's right. Preston went across there. Didn't have to go there. Got a foot of touch. Got, his, got in there. Like Not too many people stopped Greg Marge that close to the line. And... Uh, I think I felt like Greg Marge was thought he was comfortable he was going to score that try and Preston just put his body on the line got across there 
no one expected him to be there, but he put himself in the yep. position. And when you think about the culture and what they're trying to build at the Bulldogs, that's exactly what it is. Yep. Um, so he's uh, he epitomised what the dogs are trying to do at the moment and everything is all in, on, in all his actions. Yeah, plus that haircut too, eh? <laughs> What's going on? <laughs> um, yeah, pretty impressive because obviously those three guys, the big names that were out, but then they also went down to 12 men twice <laughs> in yep. the game. And in that time, not only they didn't concede, but they scored a try in each of those periods. So, I mean, they were really just firing. Um, just a little highlight on one of their youngsters as well, Lipoy Hopoy, uh, made his debut, ran 121 metres from 15 carries. Pretty good for debutants. Oh, it's nice that debutants can come in when Bulldogs are building some consistency around their performances. Um, you come in in a good time, you're not under pressure. Yeah. Well, sometimes when, when you debut kids or, or players that when they come in you're under a bit of pressure you're trying to look for a spark but you can chuck them underneath the bus a little bit there so really nice that the Bulldogs are able to bring these kids through play them while they're building some consistency while they've been training well while they're winning which then rubs off on the the individual with his performance and those stats are pretty good for for a debut game like strong strong stat yeah you're talking about the sin binnings other Jacob Saifredi was just dumb yeah, <laughs> just done what he did, you know. Just our, he's a little mate. He's uh, he's become an man. absolute. <laughs> yeah, I reckon you should chuck grump. a headgear on. I reckon you should chuck a headgear yeah, on. I might, I might have to just purchase a headgear and a bulldogs jersey. You can't. That's, he's a Queenslander man. Leave him alone. Queenslander bro. <laughs> we'll wait till after Origin. <laughs> but, but yeah, that uh, that was a silly incident, oh, wasn't just, it? Um, you know, you can't do that in the game anyway. You're already it was out of frustration. Yeah. Uh, they were under the pump. They. They were trying to find answers. It was nearly not too far in the back end of the game, and you come at him head, but now you're going to three hundred three thousand dollar fine. You're not fighting that either because you're no. mostly going to get sit on the sideline. You know the hard one was obviously that full the fullback Sinbin, but again, like they worked hard. They the the Bulldogs. You, it, it actually makes you work a little bit harder again too, which then tests tests you out as a group and how connected you are and, and what your standards are. There it was. From now on, if you're playing the dogs, are you telling your players, don't even fall for oh, Red Marnie? Hundred percent, you are. Like he's going to be doing that. Like every single person. Every, every game, he's finding someone to do it to. And <laughs> I guess the conversation would have been during the week anyway with Newcastle. Don't let this little shit get up your skin. <laughs> sure enough, he still found the way. Lucky Jack Hetherington wasn't out there. He must have <laughs> tried to fight him. Got revenge, but I can't believe that yeah, they, they let him get under their skin again oh, the second no. time in a row. And um, yeah, yeah, I wouldn't be trying This to... is what gets me. You know it's coming. Yeah. Mm. You know what he's going to do? And Jacob Saifidi surely understood he was just goading him. As soon as he did that, Reed Marnie's got him. And he, got looked him. At, he looked at um, Jacob Saifidi going... But what are you doing? Yeah. Like, what are you doing? So, like, he just stood there, let him do that, pushed yep. around, got out of there. Again, this is the problem now, eh? With all this, you're not allowed to touch anyone, yep. you're not allowed to hit anyone. Back in the days, you wouldn't see those fellas doing those no. things, but he would have got a little yeah. punch in the nose for his trouble. But can't do that anymore. But, man, some lessons learned for the Newcastle Knights. Second time now this year that they've had Reed Money come in and do something like that to their players, and they've got Sinbin yep. for it. So, man, Adam O'Brien would have been filthy when that happened. <laughs> Frustration, eh? Losing a game like that right at the end. Yeah, unnecessary. Uh, moving on to the Panthers versus the Dragons uh, at Blue Bet. 22 to 10 to the Dragons. Uh, so the Dragons defied the odds, eh? And they beat the Panthers on their home field for the first time in, I think, 15 games yeah. that they've lost at Blue Bet. How did they do it? They've been on a win streak. I don't. They haven't lost any games there, for the, like you said. You know what I mean? So I think... I thought that the Dragons are up against it. The Penrith Panthers at home, in front of their fans, although they're down, you know, Luai, I thought they could still get the job done with the talent and the calibre of uh, players that they have through, through there. Obviously, some milestone moments for some of their players uh, for this game. Um, obviously, Preston Ricky, who I've uh, I've had some dealings with through the Māori stuff and the All-Stars. Obviously, a close connection to home up in the Hokianga, so it's a massive uh, congrats to that fellow who's been working his butt off in the behind. But come up, uh, and, I, and if you watch the first half, I didn't think Dragons were any good anyway. They were pretty messy with all their, with what they were trying to do, but stayed strong, stayed tough. 
um, managed to come home in, in the second half and get a win. And they were without Ben Hunt. Some of the guys that came in stood up. I thought, you know, they did, did some great great things on the field. Up against a Penrith side that's full of talent um, and normally get jobs done around the origin yeah. time without their players as well because their system and their structures are so they are so well oiled as what, of what they do and they don't lose too many games ever. Uh, we saw their last game loss to the, the Warriors and how they turned up the following against the Sharks and gave them a bit of a touch up. So I, I guess when you look, I, I, spoke, I listened to um, Cleary speak about his, his team and he was, although he wasn't dirty as much as he was when they lost to the Warriors, he was still disappointed in some of the areas of their game because I guess you set yourself some high standards and the Penrith Panthers have always been at the top of the table and they've got high standards and they just didn't hit those targets. Yes, there were some couple of guys out, but again, you know that when the Panthers turn up, they're going to get a job done. So, you know, massive credit to to the Dragons after their, their poor start to the first half of the game. Yeah, it was really disappointing for those young debutants. They weren't able to get the win for them and you see all the footage and they do it really well, Penrith. Mm. They celebrate the milestones really well and you saw the emotion on those young fellas being able to tell their families yeah. of their beautiful moments there forever. Um, but they weren't able to get the win for those young fellas. But playing three or four of the young fellas is a lot. It's a lot of changes to your squad and a lot of inexperience rolled out on the field. I thought there were a couple of really good individual performers for the Dragons. and Raymond Faitala mm. Mariner carried on again, scored yeah. a great try, been really good. On that right edge, a lot of talk about his back row partner, Jaden Saw, and he's definitely earned his spot in the, in the Queensland side, but he's been great on that right edge after a difficult time leaving the Dogs. He mm. looks happy again, looks like he's enjoying himself. Jesse Marshkey playing in the halves, you know, running, played hooker you know, not so long ago, but took over the team and did a really good job. And I think it's a sh Shane Flanagan, again, he's putting his mark on that side. And, He's really turned them around. They're not as consistent, but they are a team that fights all the way through now. They're not the pushovers. Had to make a tough decision during the week. Um, dropped uh, Miguel Ravalawa. Mm. Um, with all the players missing out, he still thought that he didn't deserve his spot, which was a big call. When you're missing people to drop someone of his experience and say, no, your form's not good enough. It's It's can be an easy way out as a coach sometimes. Oh, well, I've got to pick them, we've got nobody else. But no, you stick true to your philosophies that I've got to play people on form. Sorry, mate, you're going to miss out. That sends a strong, strong message to the rest of your group. And this was a this was a big one. Uh, even bigger now for the Panthers is having to do go the rest of the season or go for a little while without Dylan Edwards. Yeah, well, that quad A, well, uh, it's a TV, <coughs> see how long it's going to take. Uh, just, yeah, sure. <laughs> the jersey there it's it's pretty sad but i i just want to highlight the statistic the statistical like anomaly that this game really is the 15 games panthers were unbeaten in a row at blue bet and it's been 11 games without ben hunt since their last win for the dragons so their last 11 games that they yeah. didn't have ben hunt and they lost so combine those two together this is like a pretty miraculous win for them i mean Flanagan must be doing something right, eh? I mean, you talk about his big calls and stuff like that. He's got them the win. Um, moving on to the Dolphins versus the Raiders, and holy hell, what a game this was, eh? <laughs> My goodness. Um, I mean, Jordan Rappin, eh? Freak. Old man. Yeah, well, I think, we. I think you know, if you look at the weekend's games, uh, you would have highlighted this one as one of the biggest games over mm. the weekend. Um, you know, because, again, Raiders... Obviously, just missing Hudson Young, um, Dolphins having um, Hamaso out, but then Chase in there, who's done a job before and was consistent with with their performances. Um, most probably the most controversial game we've seen in a long time this year. Um, and I heard Wayne Bennett talking; he doesn't say too much about games after games, and he, he spoke. Uh, he was had a bit of a, a voice and opinion around what happened at the end with those drop kicks. Um, again, I'm just liking, you know, I guess when it, when you think of the Raiders, and I've always said that about the Raiders, is they're just a tough team that just keeps turning up. You've got to play the 80. And in this case, they played, you know, nearly nearly the 90-minute performance. And, and like you said, you know, with Jordan Rapana, just just a, a guy that keeps turning up. Um, he, the older he gets, the, the more 
he works, um, and a lot of it, and I'm, I'm, I'm guessing his, his knees aren't any good anymore, um, <laughs> but what gets him going is, is got, it's, he's all hearts. Uh, everything he does is for the team, but he puts himself in those positions all the time. And I think I heard Ricky Stewart, and I say this too, that I always listen to a lot of the press conferences after the game. He, uh, he hates, you know, he's much the worst person he's ever coached. But everyone loves what he does. Um, but, you know, the things that you get from Jordan is those moments. Yep. He's a big game player. I've never seen him kick a field goal ever. <laughs> yes, at training, and I know they would. They said the same thing. Yes, they've seen him at, at training kick those. But man, that was tough to be able to kick those those field goals in in the pressure of the game and in the moments. Um, but yeah, you look through all the look through all their squad. I thought they did really well. Joseph Tapani is massive. Always is most consistent. I think when yep. it comes to you know, forwards in their team. He's a strong player. He's an international quality player as well. Whitehead is massive. Uh, you know, what he does for that team, yep. obviously his leadership, being the captain as well, is quality. Um, also like Trey Mooney, uh, another Māori kid that's coming on the scene, getting getting in some minutes. I think, you know, I had him in the, on the All-Stars and, and just I know that what he can bring, he's tough. Um, some more time and consistency on the field will we'll start developing him into a strong front rower. Um, so yeah, Dolphins will be filthy. You know they've they've got a they've got a strong core of players. I didn't think Anthony Milford helped the side. Um, I thought he actually made Zaka Tor do too much that he's normally done. Yeah. Obviously with Cody and and I heard Cody speak about it at the when they played the Warriors is that he tries to make sure that he gives the time to Isaiah, Isaiah Katog because he knows what he can bring. Yep. So it allows him to do his work. Mm. Um, so Anthony Milford, I didn't see Anthony Milford try and let Isaiah do what he does best, which is you know control the team around the park and just sit at the back and allow him to do his thing. So I didn't see that from Milford. And then there was a little bit of a brain snap moment that he did again with his head. He's had these moments in his game yeah. over the last... Not much really this year, uh, where he's come into the team and had these moments. I think there was a late tackle that he hit someone off the ball last time. Yeah, Reese Walsh last time he played, spent two weeks on the sideline. I, I know this isn't this isn't much like what he did, but just some of these things have crept into Anthony's game over the last year, like the last six months, which is disappointing because you know, I know and we all know what Anthony Milford can do. Whether he's, you know, not there anymore and doesn't want to play the game, I don't know. Those are the questions he has to ask himself. Yep. So it was just disappointing to see someone of his calibre not be at the best or help the side improve or be better without having Cody there. And I guess the late change with Cody, calf. You know, I, I wrote to Cody and asked him why he's out because I'm just like, come on, bro. Like, don't let your team down like this. They need you. They need you. And he, you know, him being him is just a bit of an egg. But, you know, Marshall King... Dominant player, I think he's he is the Kiwis nine right yep. now, and in the front runner with everything that he's doing. So, you know, quality quality players all through. There's some great stuff in there, but then yeah, disappointment at the end with all the uh, the stuff that went on. Yeah, good, good game in the main, and I, I thought it would be because these two are level. They're quite level. These two, you don't know what you're going to get with the with the Dolphins and and the Raiders. They can be world beaters, but then disappointing at the same time. So, uh, yeah, to go down to the wire and for it to go down controversially is mm. disappointing because the game didn't deserve that. But, uh, yeah, the Raiders, fantastic. Joey Taps, outstanding again. Um, Junior Papali'i, when he comes on, he's, he's great for them. But I just I, I feel really sorry and I, I have to wait and see what uh, the depth of the injury is to Jesse Bromwich. Mm. I, do, I just hope for him that his career is not done. I hope you're talking about a torn pick, mm. and I hope it's not too bad. And he gets to you always, especially champions who've done so much for the game to play three hundred odd games. He more than anybody deserves to go out on his own for, on his own accord and go out on his own shield. And hopefully he gets to finish the season, and it's not too bad an injury. But yeah, disappointing. I'm, I'm with Wayne and some of the rules. Um, the adjudication of some of the rules are talking about the blockers and the one where Max Plath sort of takes a step. He probably didn't help himself on that one, but heard the commentators talking about a game in the weekend that the kicking team or the chasers weren't competing on the kicks. Well, they've taken that away with this disruptor rule. The disruptors of people going up to challenge and getting penalised. So the, 
they're taking some important parts of the game out of it. You know, they really need to look at how we're affecting the game with the rules that, are, that we're implementing and have some decent discussions, some strong discussions with some coaches and players before we implement some of these rules. We talk about those um, that drop kick, the two drop kicks. Um, you know, Redcliffe should have won it. Yes, I think Plath should have just stayed still, and I think they don't. Have, they win that game. Uh, but then they do the the Joseph the Joey Tarpany one as well, and I felt like you know if if Plath he didn't touch anyone, but he yep. did move to the side. I felt like Joey Tarpany grabbed onto. Um, Marshall, King. Marshall King when he went to go kick it like a little bit and still managed to get yeah. there and touch the ball so if he doesn't hold him that's he... probably more physical contact yes. than Max Plath yes so all Matt Plath did is just walk sideways a little bit which you can't do anyway because you're trying to block yeah. the path which I see why he got the penalty but he didn't touch anyone yeah. and then Joseph Tuppen and you know went to go and hold Marshall King back and Marshall King like just for a second but enough that he couldn't get his full hand to the yeah. charge hand because he got he got some hand on that. So I get why they were blown up at the at the end of the game. And I thought with this new with the new rules coming in, they said there was something around uh, viewing and having the guys go upstairs to be able to check on um, drop goals, especially in Golden Point, because these are important moments. because it does happen in the game where the blockers get right in front and you you, you make them go every way. People hold them just yeah, like, yeah, yeah. like a little bit. So hence, that's why I thought that's why they were bringing that rule in a little bit. But didn't see that at the end and you can uh. see why Marshall King was asking the question. You could also see why Wayne asked the question. So I know they'll come out and they'll find something to say. But before this year, Blairy, it was a resting spot for a middle. Yeah. Well, well, you could yeah. put you could put three in a line. Just stand there. Yeah, you could put three in a line and make them go right around you. Now you're not even allowed to stand no. there. We well, can't even do that when they're kicking the ball anyway now because it's all these downtown rules. No. So, yeah, back in the old days, you put a little bit of a zigzag and then make them go like that to try and get to the kicker. <laughs> you know them. what I mean? Like you come up with little strategies like that. Now you can't put them there. But yeah, a couple of crucial moments in that game, and yeah, it could have gone either way. Sad that it got you know got down to that. I'm a bit like uh, Wayne. I'm interested to see what uh, Graham yeah. Annesley's comments are on the back of that. I feel a bit bad for Max Plath as well because at the, to start that set of six, yes, he caught a mean charge down, yeah. which yeah. obviously we, you said yeah. before, charge downs are getting reft out of the game in a way via the new rules. Yeah, he got a mean charge down. They get all the yep. way up, they're in for the kick, and then he just like takes a step to the left, and that's what stopped them from winning the game. So I feel a bit bad for him because he had a great game all round. He made 53 tackles. So. Wow. Good, good on you, lad, but un- <laughs> at the same time, unlucky because you lost the game. But <laughs> <laughs> Sky, bro. Uh, um, we'll move on to the final game, which was uh, controversy before the game was, uh, well, not controversy, but just things yeah. happening that. Uh, affected the game obviously Dylan Edwards like we've alluded to injured with his quad meant that the emergency <coughs> substitution was called upon of Tedesco to come into camp meaning earlier on Sunday he was called out of the squad and couldn't play for the Roosters so all that being said it meant that the Cowboys were able to best through or it didn't directly mean but the Ro- the Roosters lost to the Cowboys <laughs> yep 18 to 16, and good on the Cowboys, man. They've, I saw a stat, they've had their most players playing Origin since 2013, I think, or a long time. Six players yeah. out for Origin, and they've got it done against the probably the most informed team of the NRL. Yeah, for a team that's been up and down seasons to have you know that many players be able to represent their state, uh, it's a credit to obviously what they've done in the past but also the trust that Billy Slater has in those guys that are performing at that level. Um, yeah, I think the difference in this game was drink water. He, he pretty much owned that second half and brought the Cowboys back in the game. I just didn't think the, the Roosters, I think, you know, at home, I thought they lacked energy. I thought they lacked a little bit of, I don't know, oomph of what they normally have, where they just go after teams and, you know, Jared comes off the back fence and all these other boys do the same thing. I guess there was a lot of, um, you know, ins and outs with Kerry coming in too late. Yep. Kerry coming in late and I heard him talk after the game about, yeah, there's a bit of disruption, but we're, we're good enough and we've got quality of players around us to be able to get on there and perform. And I just don't think they perform to the best ability. Um, obviously, Walker does what he does and he tries hard and he's working hard. 
you know, and then Joseph Money at the back tried. I didn't think Joseph Money had his best game. Um, and I felt like there was most moments there where they were trying too hard as a group to try and, you know, yeah. they should have kicked on with this game. They were up at, at halftime and they should have kicked on, but a credit to uh, the Cowboys and what they're trying to do and get themselves their season back on drink water is, has been much probably their, their best player when it comes to, you know, attacking what he can do. So... Um, they'll be happy with that, with all their players. I think the biggest note is obviously Tom Malolo. Um, you know, there's been so many conversations around him of late as whether, you know, coach still wants him there or he wants to go and his contract's up in three, four years' time and he got signed on this big deal with whatever million dollars a season and hasn't been living up to those standards or, you know, the coach uh, caught him out and said that, oh, you know, some of the habits that you've done you don't like and kind of got him offside. And then sometimes he's only playing 30 minutes. You know, he, he played a big stint of time and, and smashed it. And I thought, you know, he's, I guess he's, he's getting a bit old and it's not the old Jason Tomalola that we always watch. And, you know, he was always that threat, but he's still a quality player of what he does. I think the consistency about, you know, he's had a lot of injuries in that time as well, but you know, I thought he was pretty. He was a solid performer for the Cowboys against the Roosters, and he needed to be. Confirmed for me that if you can defend against the Roosters, if your defensive game is on, you'll go close to beating them because their defence is pretty average. They can score points, and if you can stop them from doing that, you'll come over the top of them. And they stuck at it for a while. I think it was like seven or eight minutes until they took the lead. The Cowboys, but if you can stick at it and stay on the grind, force them into some errors. They forced Dom Young into some mm. errors. He went close to scoring, but yep. Borg went forward right on the try line. They started to get uh, a little bit itchy and nervous and started to do things out of yep. character, uh, the Roosters. But the Cowboys, they stayed to themselves. I thought they tried to play a little bit too passy to start the game. They were trying to get the ball to the edges when there were opportunities to run. And I thought when they decided to run, that's when uh, Finifuyaki scored his try. Yeah. And that's when Drinkwater got the three on two. Earlier in the game, I thought he might have passed, but he decided to go, get his head down, gets an inside shoulder and scores a try and picks, gets a nice run over the top of Sam Walker. So when they got their mindset right, the Cowboys were very, very good. And some of that was on the back of some vintage Tomalolo getting back mm. to it. Gone are the days for Jason of getting 300 metres a game. Yeah. We shouldn't expect that. But we can still expect what he showed last night is be impactful every time he carries the ball. There's some moments when he split defenders, bumped off, rounded out. That was vintage Tom Malolo. You don't have to do, do that 20, 30 times anymore, but every time you carry the ball, just have that impact. And you start to get back to some of that. And Yeah, he's, he found some form. That was his best game for a while yeah. for me. Yeah, it's been a while since we've seen some, some of those games from Jason and we all know what he could bring, and like you said, you're not gonna. He's not gonna be pumping out 300s. I think he was consistently pumping in that that out week in week yeah. out when he was in his prime. Eh? So I think you know 170 meters is, is a quality stint, and 55 minutes is not bad for a yeah. guy that they think that you know he may be time to move on or you know he's not at his best anymore. If you can get a quality 55 minutes out of him, and he's giving you 170 meters and you know eight tackle breaks and. Those things, I think that's that's where he, that's how you got to use them. Um, it was a big game though, coming up against the Roosters. They, they were men down uh, the Cowboys. I would have thought the Roosters would have gone on and win this game, but they're not, not to be. Um, they got some strong back rowers. Those Cowboys, you know, bringing Nano back yeah. in Fitzgerald when he's running. Oh, yeah, I think Hilton I think the, the um, Dolphins have picked him up, eh? Yeah, yeah. yeah so exactly. you know, a great, and I th and I definitely think the Dolphins have got some good strong back rows now. But man, you add him into there run him off uh, Katoa and, and, and Cody and see what they can do. He'd be damaging because that try that he scored, ooh, there, was yeah, no yeah. Way, there was no way stopping no. him. But he's got, he had a good awareness of, um, you know, when he went to the try, he was coming across, the fullback comes across, he spins Spin. the other way. So it's actually really good awareness from a young player that, like, if you're going that way and, and a fullback's coming across you, he's mostly going to be able to hold you up and push you that yep. way. But as he come around, he just spun to his back and spun back the other way and scored that try. So I thought, Brilliant. you know, it was mostly, you know, when you look at the games and you watch it in, like, in the detail, yeah, yeah. that's what I saw. I was like, oh, that's that's Start not bad. Start to see players yeah, like yeah. you. That's, that's not, not, not bad for you young kid to be able to have that awareness or that sense of you know if someone's coming across me just to spin that other way just to get down and find the ground so 
yeah, great great signs for for both uh, for the Cowboys and their back rows and what they've been able to do. And speaking of the the Cowboys youth specifically, there were three debuts. Two of them were young Cowboys: Jackson Purdue and Jamal Shibasaki. And then the Aroosters had Blake Steep. But I thought, man. Purdue and Shibasaki were pretty impactful for the Cowboys as well, especially later on in the game, in their first game ever. Well, again, like well, like every debut, you want it to be your best debut, and you want to make it memorable, and you want to go out there and give it your best. You're never gonna see a lack of effort from guys that nope. debut, um, and then when things are going right on the field, normally these guys are the ones that stand up and they do their job and they get it done. So a great like de- debut for all all three of those guys. Uh, is that Gamut's, um, Gamut Shibazaki's brother? Yeah, like, yeah. yeah, yeah. And, and I had some dealings with Gamut, his brother, through the, my Broncos So I'm a young fellow when I come through, um, good kid. Um, went over to, obviously, rugby over in Japan and has come back around and trying to find his way back into to the Cowboys. But to see his brother doing something similar, yeah. uh, going after his, his dream and getting a start, like, you know, we all know how hard it is to get to NRL level and to actually get a debut. So these guys, yeah, credit to those guys, but also credit to the uh the Cowboys were giving them that opportunity as well. Robert Louis' nephews. Yep. All so there too. The uncle nice. could play a bit too. Nice. But yeah, a bit like uh, I spoke about um, Moala Graham Tolfa. Yes. His debut for the Warriors mm. last week. When you make your debut, you don't have to stand out. You don't have to do anything to try and win the game unless in, you know, you're, you're in that situation. You just be steady and give it your best. Do everything you do at an 8 out of 10. That's why you're there. Mm. So that's what those young fellas did. They were, they had the right impact for what the team needed. Funny when uh, Purdue and Jennings would come together, and the commentators kept saying it. Uh, he's <laughs> twice his age, literally thirty-six year old to an eighteen year old, which is pretty funny. I've got a hot take here. Hot about take. The here we go. I think Terrell May might be their best front rower at the Roosters, like right now. Not on the historical, but. For this season so far, I reckon he's been the the best front rower in their team. I thought that last night, the way he's played. Yeah, he's, he's, he's obviously played more than Jared has through his suspensions, but he's been good this year. You know, he's fit too, he can play some minutes, but he's had some really good touches throughout the year and defensively worked hard. He's got a bit of, I reckon for a front row, he's got some X factor mm. about him. Um, we see him throw a long ball too, get up off the ground yeah. and throw a long mm. ball. Looked like he'd been playing a bit of touch in the backyard. <laughs> um, but yeah, he's got an engine, works hard. He's hard to handle, different body shape compared to Jared. Um, tough, to, tough to handle that fellow. So yeah, I, I reckon he's doing well for, for the Roosters. I think, yep, he could be, you could be spot on there. Good when shot, it comes, eh? When it just, comes just, to, you know. Uh, just because he's been there for... He's been there every game. Yep. Uh, he hasn't been injured, really. And then Lindsay Collins, Jared, even Victor Radley have all had their injuries yeah. and have had games where they haven't been maybe as sharp Spencer. as they are, always are, and Spencer as well. And getting better with every game. Yeah. Get, and, you know, obviously his minutes, you know, 75 minutes in the middle of the park. You know, for a big boy, they carry. Yeah. Yeah. You know, he carries a bit of size to him. So, yeah, he gets around well. Great tip. And bro. speaking of Jared, he... Did his hamstring Hemi. apparently as too well? Too fast. So. <laughs> they all follow too fast. Eh? Man. Too explosive <laughs> off the line. <laughs> Careful, Jared. Uh, so that was all the games for the the week. But obviously, we did our first Origin preview. Now it's time for our second Origin preview: the men's game, which game one is on Wednesday, two days time, ten o'clock New Zealand time, eight o'clock Australian time at a core stadium. And obviously, again, I. I hate that I have to keep saying it, but it's news, so i got to keep saying it. Dylan Edwards is injured with his quad. Don't know how long that's going to be for. But, I mean, I guess, thankfully, James Tedesco is, is uh, you know, a humble guy. He can probably, you know, accept that he didn't get picked. Coming I told you a couple now. of weeks ago, you fellas are all dramas, man. <laughs> but, but this is an injury. That's a, dramas. That's, that's a, this is a different kind of drama. This is just like, yeah. oh, this is sad drama that Dylan Edwards <coughs> is injured. But, yeah, so... New South are still going to win. Don't well, get me wrong. Well, you had they had the state divided when it come to um, you know who yeah. was going to be the New South Wales fullback. Yep. Um, we over here in our small little country, New Zealand, Aotearoa, mm-hmm. said we wanted Dylan Edwards. Um, we got what we wanted, but now he's gone. Will he? He's gone. Uh, disappointed. <laughs> I'm, I'm, you know, disappointed <laughs> for for a guy that's worked his butt off. 
worked his butt off for a long time in the NRL and been consistent at that as well. And yes, he had his critics because, again, people obviously thought James Adesco didn't do anything wrong. Uh, you know, Madge Maguire was going in a different direction and thought Don Edwards, you know, earned his position, earned his spot, worked really hard over the last few years of being in that position. And, um, you know, to come to a quad injury, you know, this close to, to, the, to the game on Wednesday night is is disappointing. But again, when you when you think about losing Dylan Edwards and you have someone like Tedesco, who was half of the state's choice anyway, um, it's not a bad loss to have. Um, mm. He will have a point to prove, definitely have a point to prove. I reckon we're going to see the best Tedesco in origin that we've seen in a long time. Mm. I think this is an opportunity for him to say, hey, he should have picked me in the first place. Um, he wouldn't be thinking like that, but I know he'd go out there yep. and, and rip in and give him his best shot because he knows that Dylan Edwards is knocking on the door um, and wasn't picked at first, but gets an opportunity. Like everything in the game of rugby league, when one door shuts, another one opens, and you get another opportunity to go after the, the Queensland team. So you, you look through the you look through both sides. I think, man, there's some quality quality players all through the side. It's going to be a great matchup on Wednesday night. I can't wait for the kickoff. I'm excited for this. Obviously, we're Queensland hard in here, except for you. Um, yeah, you're quiet too. Um, no, so, yeah, just, just, we're definitely, um, yeah, Queensland hard over here. So, looking forward to this this one, Willie. It'll be a, a big night for rugby league. Huge. It very rarely does origin come down to tactics. It's just come down. It's a war of attrition because mm. it's so fast for 80 minutes. And you speak to players that have been in that cauldron, they talk about the pace of the game, their first game, and just how it blows you away, and it's the team that can fight through that. I think what this game, what I like about this matchup is the two packs. Mm. Payne Haas, uh, Liam Martin, Angus Crichton, they've got engines that'll go and go and go. Big test for Ruben Cotter, Lindsay Collins, and Pat Carrigan especially. You know, those those three are, are an important key to, to Queensland, especially Carrigan and Cotter, because they, uh, they're built for it. I, I, I think they're the atypical origin player. Just go, tackle everything, run every time you're called upon. You do that a little bit harder, more times, more frequently than your opposition, then more often than not at this stage, in this game, you come over the top. And I think that's what's going to happen on the weekend. They'll create some opportunities for Hammer. And I'm not being biased, this is just how I see the game going. I think Hammer will, will get some open spaces and get some opportunities to run. I, I see Cobo coming off the bench being dangerous. But yeah, I, I agree. I think Teddy's going to be a, a big, big key for New mm. South Wales in this one. If we, if we're so, so let's say that the Blues win the first game and then Dylan Edwards' injury isn't that bad. He's back in a couple of weeks. But Tedesco was man of the match in game one and they won the game. <laughs> you can't drop him. Yeah, you, you, you can't. You can't, you can't no, he, he holds his position. And this is what, it, this is what happens. Eh? This mm. is the game of rugby league. Someone gets injured, someone comes and gets a job done. They win comfortably or they win at all, I think he, everyone holds their position. I don't think, unless there's some tactical changes or an injury again, um, then nothing changes for, for the team that wins, um, you know. So it's, it, that's why Origin or Rugby League's such a great game is because this is what it, it what can happen. Um, someone comes in and gets a job done. I like that. For me, it's the exciting outside backs for the New South Wales. I think, you know, when you look at Brian Toto and what he does consistently, Crichton and what he's been doing, Lomax with the high balls, and then Swali'i, man, they are X-Factor players. Um, and, and and on the flip side, you look at the origin, they're, just, they're your typical state of origin players. Yep. They're just going to get you a job done. So it's X-Factor versus your typical origin players. Which one's going to get it? I don't know. But I think there's still maybe some movement in these teams late before Wednesday. Um, with I think you know I think as a yo might jump into yeah, the lock I position. So. I think they're going to have to have a little bit of movement. You're not going to be able to just go crash and bash. Um, that's normally the first 10, 15 minutes. But after that, you want to be able to open up the game. I'm guessing like someone like Suli comes through the middle yeah. of the park and starts doing it. But with Isaiah Yeo and his ball playing, he may be the person that can create more opportunities for for New South Wales. So there may be some late changes. Cam McInnes, what's he going to cover? Nine. 9.13. 9.13, so, you know, so it could be interesting how it's used, but this is good old rugby league tactics. You don't name a team till an hour before the kickoff and things could change. They would have all these scenarios done at training. There's always sicknesses in, in Queensland camp, yep. always. Um, <laughs> there's always tactics being played. The conversation's always about, you know, 
Queensland being the underdogs, even though they must be not the underdogs, and you know New South Wales has been always favourites. So it's always it's always such a good conversation hearing people talk about it. But it's always great to hear how passionate the fans are and how passionate are people that have also played for their states and the way they talk about these things too when it comes to this. And we're over here in New Zealand and we get excited about this game, so it's great because you know at the end of the day, rugby league's the winner. But if you're for a state, you win. There'd be a lot of bets going on with your mates over over the next couple of days, that's for sure. Can we get a predicted score line from each of you guys? What well, like exact score line just as Oh I'm gonna go Queensland eighteen sixteen. Ooh. All right, all right. I'm going Queensland twenty sixteen. I'm going New South twenty four twenty. Those? Um Yeah, I'll go Queensland twenty two eighteen. Whatever, man. <laughs> hey, so, hey when, know, we, when we run man. this back, you're going to be a happy man. Whoever's, whoever wins, there's going to be some happy people wow. in there. There's going to be some sad people. <laughs> I mean, I feel like New South just, you got to win for me, man, because i got three uh, Queenslanders around <laughs> me that are just going to be bullying me all next week if you guys don't win. So please get it done for me, guys. And I got one more. How about a predicted man of the match? Uh, predicted man of the match for me will be Cherry Evans. Yeah, Cherry Evans. Cherry Evans. Oh. Fair dues. I was thinking, man, I reckon, I reckon, oh. Surely you're going to say Tedesco. Pull it out. Nah, I was, oh, Tedesco's a good one, but I was going to say Payne Haas, I think, is, is a rogue shout. Like, well, it's not a rogue shout because he's mean, but it's random. <laughs> But yeah, it's red him. That's what that is. Score try. That's what I'm saying. And he's going to get man of the match. He's going to get 50 tackles. How often does a middle get man of the match? <laughs> he, he, do you watch many stand origins? Often enough for me to make that decision. Um, anyway, so that origin is coming up. Watch our show next week, obviously, because we're going to break it down. But before we leave, let's do some previews of next week's game or next weekend's games as well, because there's yep. some. Exciting games, and we need a way to get the Warriors into the episode. So yeah, the Warriors are playing the Cowboys <laughs> next week at Queensland Country Bank Stadium. Um, maybe some returns. Yeah, for all our, our Warriors fans, uh, we are now here for you guys. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> this is where you come in. Um, so yeah, I guess you know a, a massive week for the Warriors uh, coming up against a Cowboys team. A lot of returns for the Cowboys. Do they play after Origin or do they keep the team that beat the Roosters? That'll be some hard decisions, and even more harder decisions over on the other side at the Warriors, where consistent the last two weeks have played much really their best football uh, for a long time this year and managed to get some good wins without some of their key players. You know, 11, 11 players on the sideline, eight NRL players as well, and managed to be able to get these wins against, obviously, some top four teams, Panthers and the Dolphins. So some hard decisions to make. They are much probably going to get some players back, be nice for the Warriors, but also be nice to see them actually, um, you know, have some faith in some of these guys that have got the jobs done. Um, you know, does Sean come back? What does happens to Tamari and Chanel? Who takes that position? Who gets on the 14 bench? Tohu may be back. Does Dylan Walker still stay at the 13? I think he's been doing a great job through the middle. Marata's back. You've got some back rowers. Um, some hard decisions for the Warriors that, uh, coming into this this game and which way they go, we'll have to wait and see. It's Tuesday night is the um, team list Tuesday, so everyone will be on the edge, especially all our Warriors fans saying who's going to get uh, in the team. And I'm thinking they're all going to be saying, hey, well, these guys have got a job done. Why aren't we sticking with them? We'll see what it comes out like. Yeah, 100%. There'll be some uh, big questions in the selection meeting for the coaching staff at the Warriors. A lot of players have press for their claims. Adam Pompey's been outstanding mm. and you know, probably holds his spot. But, yeah, when some others come back, the halves is an interesting one. You know, Sean probably comes in, but for who? And you know, tomorrow he's been outstanding. And does his game change with Sean in there? He's been in control the last couple of weeks and done a really good job in running the show. And he's going to have to take a back seat, I presume, with, with Sean coming back or Sean going, to, hey, let's share the limelight and share the, the role of running the team. You know, save for the North Queensland Cowboys. I think their origin boys come straight back in um, as as you deserve to. And as Mitch Barnett will come straight back in the Warriors mm. after his week away and see whether he takes part tomorrow night. On Wednesday night first, he may, may be part of the game. We don't know. But, yes, difficult. But the Warriors hopefully uh, can continue 
to get on and get their third win in a row. Yeah, next. And then there's also Broncos versus Sharks. So the Sharks, an opportunity to bounce back. Yeah. But you'd imagine Broncos will be pretty full strength. Carrigan back up, Haas back up, stuff like that. I mean, can the Sharks continue or will they continue their slump or can they bounce back? They're going to need a bounce back, um, you know, because they're going to come up against a Broncos side at Suncorp Stadium after, you know, after Origin. And and typically those boys that do return typically lift the standard of the quality of, of, of their game around them because I guess that's, you know, when you become an Origin player, it's how you come back after that as well. And in your performance, you can't just have a real good game in origin and then turn up on, you know, when they play and not put in the performance. So, you know, although the Sharks are going to be able to have to um, work hard to get this win and get themselves out of this little slump that they're in, defensive is going to be their problem. They're coming up against the Broncos that play fast. Uh, they play a fast brand of rugby league, so they're going to have to get their bodies in front and work really hard defensively, and um, we'll see how that all plans out when they back up after Origin, if they get any injuries. If not, it uh, could be a good game. I reckon this will actually, no, it's going to be a good game. Broncos will be hungry too. After losing to the Titans, surprisingly, last time yeah. out at Suncorp, they'll want to reverse that and get back to winning ways. They'll have to try and do that against a side that's going to be just as hungry in the Sharks. Sharks don't want to go three in a row, but Broncos don't want to go two in a row either. Uh, and then the Panthers versus the Seagulls. Obviously, the Panthers have had a string of weeks of interesting games, and the Seagulls have been on and off the whole season. Uh, so that'll be an interesting one at Blue Bed again. Yeah, and I think, yeah, obviously, Panthers are going to be disappointed. We see their reaction after their last win. They'll double down just to out without some players there. The Seagulls, they're like... You don't know what team turns up when the Seagulls play, but when they're on, they are on. Uh, you know, Daly and Homoli, when they're playing, they are solid. They're going to be backing up again. There's no way that they're sitting on the sidelines. Which is, I think for me, this is much better the game of the round. Uh, I feel like, you know, both teams have got quality players and stars all through it. And, um, yeah, be interesting to see how this one goes. Can't wait. Yeah, me too. I don't think uh, the Panthers go two in a row too often, losing two in a row. I think they'll be too good at home. They want to get things right in front of their own fans. They'll be working hard. Yeah, those guys that are involved in Origin, they'll know the impact that they need to have when they come back um, against the Sea Eagles and, and try and put them to the sword. And they won't want to have too many more slip ups this year, regardless whether it's during the Origin period or not. And final game we'll touch on Eels versus Bulldogs as the last of the round at a core. The Eels are back, baby. But so are the Bulldogs. Who's going to win that one? Yeah, big game. Expectation on the Eels now uh, from the outside in, especially, uh, you know, around having those boys back and what they delivered on the weekend. Um, so, again, up against a quality Bulldog side that is building something very nicely. Um, like Willie said, he's in there, there, in, there um, in his tops for his pick in the eight. So, um you know, consistently they'll get some players back as well, so it will just add some more power to their team. I'm um, excited to see what Para can do and how Bulldogs can uh, stand up to what Parramatta did off their performance, yep. especially with those middle forwards, because I think if you look at the teams and you look at the middle, the forward pack, uh, if, if you've been really honest, you look at the Eels, what they can deliver and what they did deliver. If they can deliver something similar like that, the Bulldogs will find them hard to um, you know, break down. But again, Bulldogs' defence has been key. Confidence is, uh, is special, can make you do wonderful things and they're full of confidence now. The Eels after last week, full of confidence in each other and back in their system again. Uh, but the dogs, they're clicking. They're clicking together. they are um, been doing some things this year that have taken some time. We talk about their left edge. Their right edge is starting to take some control through Preston and Crichton. Trying to find whether Tommy Sexton, to, uh, Sexton is their half or not, um, I think he's the one. He's the one that's got to sit on that right edge with Burton on the left when they start to click. And I I think uh, it'll all come together soon. And I expect them to do uh, a job this week and, and get the eels. Much like me, my brother is a loyal fan of clubs and uh, he's watched the last two games of the Bulldogs and he's a Bulldogs fan now, so he'll be looking forward to that game. Uh. Um, it'll also be interesting to see... <coughs> Mitchell Moses, his performance, and then obviously off the back of Origin, whether mm. he has a shot of actually getting his jersey back in the New South Wales squad, yeah. right? Yeah, well, if, it can go either way, depending on what the result is, will yeah. determine on what happens around the players and who yep. comes in and who goes out. So 
they win. I think they stick to the same method. Again, it's hard to just swap in and out of players and not being consistent with, with, your, with your spine especially. And over the years, this is where New South Wales has typically gone wrong is they're trying everyone and anyone and haven't got it right. So I think if they win, he stays in. If they, they all stay in, if they lose, they'll be asking questions around what they can do better to help them get the win that they need. I think there'd be one exception to that, and that's yep. Cleary. If yep. Cleary, was, Cleary was fit, regardless of the result, I think you pick him. He's yeah. the best seven in the world at yep. the moment. He's, yep. He puts himself pretty much. So, yeah, I think he's the only one mm. that changes that. Mm. How long is he out for? Do you know Ephraim? Uh, he gets back round 20, I think, or 21. Okay. So, after we wait. Origin, he won't be back yeah. after yeah. Origin. Yeah, yeah. Sadly. <laughs> oh. Well, Fano, that is it for this episode. Make sure you tune into all our channels, social media, run straight in our YouTube as well. Uh, we'll see you again next time. Let's go. Ready?